This is the deck of the Harry S. Truman as it sends the next wave of fighter jets into Yemen. With just 30 seconds between each of these launches, the crew can get its entire carrier wing up in less time than it takes for a pizza to be delivered. But for all of this to work, some amazing systems need to help the Truman fight the Houthis, and they're all centered around this single molecule of water. This water molecule begins its journey inside one of two A4W pressurized water reactors on board the USS Harry S. Truman. Buried in six-inch thick steel containment, each reactor generates over 550 megawatts of thermal power, enough to light up a small city. And this process generates a ton of heat. As the nuclear reactor runs, the heat it generates transfers into a closed-loop primary system which flows around the reactor core. Inside here, the water reaches temperatures of nearly 600 degrees Fahrenheit without ever boiling. That's because it's kept under intense pressure, over 2,200 PSI, to keep it liquid as it races through the pipes. But how does the catapult get steam if it doesn't boil over? That's where this machine comes in. What you see here is called a steam generator. After superheating around the reactor core, this water goes through a shell and tube-type heat exchanger like this one. Here, the superheated high-pressure water flows through tubes inside this enclosed shell that is full of purified water. As the water travels through, it heats the lower-pressure water to turn it into steam. It's still hot and pressurized to around 600 psi, but the water is now not radioactive and usable. Up on the deck, Crew members attach a launch bar on the nose gear to a shuttle hooked to a piston below. That piston is waiting at the end of a sealed steam cylinder that runs nearly the length of a football field. When the shooter gives the signal, valves open and release 5,000 cubic feet of superheated steam into the chamber, instantly driving the piston and the aircraft forward. And it all has to be done with complete precision. This is because the pressure needs to be around 450 to 520 PSI at launch. If it is too low, the aircraft won't get enough oomph to get off the deck and splash into the water. If it's too much, it can actually crack and damage the airframe. That's why sailors must maintain these pressures with strict plus or minus 10 PSI tolerances for aircraft and pilot safety. Thankfully, the engineers on board the Truman have done this literally a thousand times before and the pressure spike launches the F-18 from zero to 150 knots in just under 300 feet. This breathtaking launch subjects the pilot to a bone-crushing three Gs of force in less than three seconds. By the time the jet leaves the deck, it's moving faster than a bullet from a handgun, and the steam system is already resetting for the next aircraft. All told, this system allows the Truman to launch a fully armed strike package every 30 seconds per catapult meaning that four aircraft can take off every two minutes. With proper coordination and prep, the crew can surge up to 120 combat sorties per day. Each jet can be turned around, refueled, rearmed, and relaunched in under 90 minutes, with these times halved for at general quarters. That means by the time the first wave is returning to the carrier, the next wave is already airborne. And with this rhythm, the Truman doesn't just launch planes, it unleashes a relentless tempo of steel and fire on America's enemies. And today, it's going to be put to the test. While the flight deck roared with the thunder of departing aircraft, an even more dangerous threat loomed just beyond the horizon. On March 16th, on the second day of Trump's campaign of never-ending strikes against the Houthis, the USS Harry S. Truman found itself at the center of an unprecedented attack. Dozens of Houthi drones launched simultaneously from concealed positions across western Yemen raced toward the carrier strike group at low altitude in a coordinated attempt to overwhelm its defenses. But the Truman was ready thanks to these radars. At the heart of the carrier's situational awareness are its powerful air search radars, systems that not only detect airborne threats like drones but also help prevent friendly fire by meticulously de-conflicting airspace for the dozens of friendly aircraft in the skies at any given moment. The first in line of detection is the SP-848E, or Spitz-48 three-dimensional radar. Mounted high on the island superstructure, this electronically scanned array can track targets out to 220 nautical miles, 
it can simultaneously track over 500 air contacts while providing data on each target's altitude, range, and bearing every four seconds. How this radar is able to provide altitude data is through something called elevation angles, which is a key component of its capability. An elevation angle works like this. At 24 different intervals from about 0.2 to 28.2 degrees, the radar sends an energy beam at each angle. Depending on when and where the radar energy hits the aircraft will help the radar determine the contact's elevation, which is crucial for air defense. And while this would be crazy enough on its own, the scale at which the radar does it is mind-boggling. With a peak power output of 2.5 megawatts, it's capable of detecting low-flying drones with radar cross-sections as small as 0.5 square meters, equivalent to a stealthy quadcopter at ranges of up to 90 nautical miles away. With its 24 different elevation angles and 360-degree sweep, it's often the first to pick up low-altitude drones like these Iranian sheheads trying to sneak in under the radar. But even if those drones somehow make it past this radar, there is another one standing between them and the carrier. This is the AN-SPQ-9B radar. It is a high-resolution X-band radar specialized for tracking surface targets. However, it also has an air mode that allows it to scan for low-altitude aerial threats, which is exactly what the crew is doing right now. With a range of 80 nautical miles, this radar refreshes its track data every 1.7 seconds and can distinguish between multiple objects just 2 meters apart. This precision allows it to track fast-moving drones even when they fly by in a tight formation or when multiple friendly aircraft are operating nearby. This is possible because of horizontal beam width, which is the width of the radar beam where its power drops to half of the maximum is just 1.1 degrees which allows it to distinguish targets operating in close proximity to each other. With all of these features, its deduction probability on slow-moving UAVs exceeds 90% even with sea clutter. This radar is crucial for threat prioritization, determining which inbound targets are hostile and which are not, and it perfectly confirms that there's a drone swarm inbound. Once the swarm was detected, the Truman's Air Defense Officer and Combat Direction Center sprang into action. Dozens of air attacks were flooding in, with Shahids flying as low as 50 feet off the water trying to mask themselves as sea clutter. But the Truman's radar network saw through all these tactics. In a matter of seconds, these two radars sorted out the threats from the friendlies, classified each target, and began queuing weapon systems and aircraft accordingly. In less than 30 minutes, more than 40 aircraft from the Truman were in the air. Any one of them could be mistaken for a hostile drone if the radars weren't precisely calibrated. That's where the ship's cooperative engagement capability comes into play. CEC creates a single, high-fidelity air picture that spans hundreds of miles by fusing radar data from multiple ships and aircraft. With each friendly aircraft digitally tagged and tracked in real time, the risk of friendly fire drops to near zero, even with the chaos of combat. But as the flight continues and Houthi drones keep falling, the F-18s begin running out of ammo. As each successive wave of jets comes back to refuel and rearm, this place is what keeps them in the fight. Called the Bomb Farm, and it's how the U.S. Navy is keeping the F-18s armed in this sustained fight. The Truman's Bomb Farm, officially known as the Ordnance Assembly and Handling Area, is located between the island and the railing on the flight deck. This place is the beating heart of the carrier's striking power. Here, sailors build the bombs that turn F-18s into flying sledgehammers, and it all starts from deep below deck in the bowels of the ship. These magazines are massive storage rooms encased in armor that are kept at tightly regulated temperatures. As each successive wave of fighters goes out, the Combat Information Center tells the Aviation Ordnance men what weapons are going to be on the next wave. These sailors then go to the magazines and gather the required bomb components – warheads, guidance kits, tail fins, etc. – and bring them to a weapons elevator on specially designed pallet jacks. The Truman has four such elevators, with two servicing the forward magazine and one servicing the aft. Each elevator can move 10,000 pounds per trip and deliver ordnance from the magazines to the flight deck in just under 90 seconds. 
Once out on deck, the Truman crew hauls out the munition components and assembles them on special equipment. Here, sailors do things like mate the warhead with its guidance kit. For example, the GBU 31J dam is built by attaching a KMU 557 tail assembly and strakes to a BLU 109 warhead. This kit transforms a dumb bomb into a GPS guided weapon with a circular error probability of just 13 meters, even in contested environments. It takes a proficient team just 15 minutes to make a single weapon, and dozens of sailors work here. After quality assurance verification by senior leadership, the completed bombs are loaded onto carts and taken up to the hangar bay, where aircraft are already being fueled and inspected. Through this coordinated effort, the Truman's crew can fully rearm 20 aircraft with precision munitions in less than an hour. This rapid tempo ensures that the Truman can keep its aircraft armed and in the fight with minimal downtime, even during sustained combat operations. And the Truman needs that tonight. Over the course of several hours, Truman's air wing fired dozens of AIM-120 AMRAAM and AIM-9 Sidewander missiles at the incoming drones. But it's not enough. The Houthis are trying to break American defenses by coming from multiple angles at the same time and a few drones managed to slip through the chaos. But that's why the Truman has this secret weapon as a failsafe. The Truman is armed with one of the Navy's most effective point defense systems, the RIM-162 Evolved Sea Sparrow Missile, or ESSM, and it is no ordinary missile. Designed to intercept fast, high-speed maneuvering threats, each ESSM is housed in a quad pack configuration within one of two Mark 29 guided missile launchers. But these missiles are not just plentiful, they are extremely capable and will turn the tide of this battle. With a blistering top speed of Mach 4, the ESSM can intercept targets at ranges up to 50 kilometers and altitudes of up to 15,000 meters. Guided by a dual-mode radar seeker, the ESSM Block II variants on the Truman can home in on targets with their own active seeker rather than receive guidance via the ship's illuminators. This gives the ship the flexibility to engage sea-skimming missiles, diving drones, or even ballistic threats, all while keeping its resources dedicated to maintaining an air picture. And that is exactly what happened. During a brief lull when the one group of F-18s was leaving and one was coming back, several Shahid drones pierced the 20-kilometer engagement protective bubble surrounding the ship. After its SPIS-48 radar locks onto it, the contacts trip the logic of the Truman ship's self-defense system. Without warning, the system fires eight ESSMs at a cost of around $10 million in under 30 seconds. Thanks to the ESSM's 50 G-force terminal maneuver, not even manned aircraft, much less low-tech drones, can escape it. In less than 60 seconds, the ESSM shred what remains of the drone swarm as the Truman's crew gets ready for the next battle. Bye for now.